Uh, my next guest has been behind a bench in hockey going back to the late 80s and most recently uh, with the Colorado Eagles. He is now the new head coach of the Anaheim Ducks. No stranger to the NHL, no stranger uh, to hockey uh, at all in uh, at a lot of different levels. Uh, please welcome to the program, Greg Cronin. Greg, first of all, congratulations on getting the Anaheim nod. Thanks so much for doing this today. Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a blessing to get the job, and I'm thrilled to be back in the NHL. Now, when, when uh, it's interesting, you know, sometimes it's the first name that you hear who ends up with the job. You know, with, with Calgary, the first name we heard was was Conroy. He ended up getting it, you know, last year with, with Montreal. It was Kent Hughes, and he ended up getting it, Brad Trilliving in Toronto. So it's interesting when, uh, when, when the vacancy occurred in Anaheim, you were, I think, the first name to sort of pop up, and then it went really, really quiet, which uh, from my perch I don't like. <laughs> Uh, from the, <laughs> but nonetheless, um, you know, I, I think you and Pat Verbeek did a really good job of keeping it quiet. But while things were so quiet, what were the talks like? Like, what did Pat Verbeek need to hear from Greg Cronin? Well, Pat had a very specific vision of what he needed to um, be his head coach, particularly with this this multiple waves of newcomers coming through the draft. Um, the current players that we do have, like the Zegras, is McTavish, is Drysdale's, and Terry's, right? So he knew that he had a uh, have a coach that had an experience in development um, and also had lengthy history coaching. He felt that was going to be one of his prerequisites. Um, create, you know, Culture create, which is a catchy word, but create a culture and an environment where there's some transparency and there's some measurable growth from the players, um, I've been fortunate in my career to go through a number of stops where that was a component in it, going all the way back to the late 90s when Mike Milbury hired me from um, from when I started the U.S. National Training Program um, mm-hmm. in New York. And going all the way back then, the NHL was totally different, but there was an older team with Robert Reichel, Trevor Linden, Ziggy Palfrey, that group. And then it didn't work, so it, we had to switch gears and go into a development mode, which wasn't even a word back then. It was all about win, win, win. And that group and it was replaced with the Sedano Chars and Timmy Conley's and Taylor Pyatt's. And literally, Mike was the first guy. Everybody has development camps now. like It's like tradition now. or yeah. It's a schedule now to go right after the draft, right? So Mike started that. So my roots to that development piece that Pat was looking for go all the way back to, you know, 25 years ago. So I think it was a perfect fit, and we had great conversations, kicking things around, and it just ended up meshing really well. Is there a, um, you know, because I think we always we always look for the, we, we look for links when there are hires. Okay, like, who who's the link between this coach and that general manager? Did they cross over when they played? Was there a coach-player relationship? How does, how does, uh, how does Cronin get to Verbeek? What, what has to happen in between? Now, that's a great question, Jeff. And I, I, if you were to ask me this a year ago, I was just getting ready to do an interview with the Boston Bruins. And that to me, like, and, I, and I've asked that same question you asked me probably a hundred times because I've been doing this so long and I see people that get jobs and I try and connect the dots and I don't really know where the dots yeah. started or where they connect. Um, so, you know, I, I didn't know Pat. I didn't know him at all. Um, I think ultimately what happens is um, a guy that I work with was, was my direct boss in Colorado was Craig Billington. And uh, Craig actually retired a year ago, played a long time in the league, had a lot of stops. He, one of his first stops is in New, New Jersey. Jersey with Pat. Yeah. New Jersey. So that's he, okay that's, Pat, what, okay. that's yeah. what it is. All right. Yeah. So Pat and Craig knew each other and, but you know, with respect for the process, there was no, you know, Dallas has a job and there was no announcement. So it was actually, Craig had told me, I, I think if, if there's a change in Anaheim, you and Pat would mesh really well, even though he's a Western Ontario farmer and I'm a Boston guy. And it's a strange dynamic, but <laughs> he predicted it and, it and it and it really meshed well. That is so interesting. Craig Billington being the uh, the the link there. See, I I I spend so much of my time trying to figure out links. Like I, I'm with you. I try to figure out okay, what, why does this work? How does that work? And you try to you know figure out what the association is. So was there? I'm curious about the interviews as well. I know there's only so far you can go, but w- were there certain things that right away 
just clicked with you and, and Pat for Beak, like visions, ideas. I know you're a, you're like your reputation is you're a great communicator. You develop young athletes very well, uh, and you're a very strong X's and O's coach. Like, what what were the areas and what were the things that you and Verbeek really clicked on? Well, again, uh, uh, Pat, um, he, he's he's like laser focused, okay, and he's and I didn't know that until I met him, okay. But people, so Craig was the first guy that talked to me about him, and then you know Pat does his homework, and then I do my homework on him, and. I get the same feedback from people that he's, he's very focused, very intense. He's not a BS guy, um, which I am. I mean, that, that matches what I am. And then uh, he just gave me a couple questions that were broad questions that to me are like umbrella questions that things are going to drop from. And uh, nothing written down. You know, Don Sweeney was a little bit more uh, methodical in his approach in terms of questions, what he wants sent in, sent in and talking points that would be platforms to the next level of discussions. And, I think Pat was, I think he had a plan, but he was spitballing. So when I sat down, we talked about philosophy, which everybody talks about. Okay. And everything, I don't care what you're doing in life starts with your own individual identity. And if it's not honest and authentic, then you're in trouble. That's what I think. People can BS all they want, but eventually somebody's going to sniff them out. So I, I didn't have an agenda. He did, but it wasn't a, a laser like pointed agenda. It was okay. Let's start here. And let's see where this goes. It was very organic. I think he had budgeted two hours. And by the time we got up, it was five hours later. Either one of us had a drip uh, drip of water or or went to the bathroom. That sounds like a uh, a very lengthy and thorough conversation. Um, You know, the the, the one player that I'm I'm curious about, and my time's limited here, so I got to start going shotgun style with you. The one player that I'm curious about, because I'm looking at the the Anaheim lineup and I'm like, okay, so where's the overlap here? And I stop on Ryan Strom. Now, when you were with the Islanders, he would have been, I'm guessing, 20 years old, maybe Mm -hmm. 21 years old. He's almost 30 years old um, now. What was Ryan Strom like? with you and the Islanders? First of all, he's a great, he's a great kid. He's got a great family. I mean, I like his dad. I met his dad. I like Ryan's a, a really quality human being. You can tell he, he, tell he was brought up the right way. And uh, when we had him, um, he's obviously a top 10 pick. He's a talented player. He, he yeah. kind of played on the perimeter. And he played in the perimeter a lot because he was a, he was a skinny, skinny kid and probably wasn't confident with his strength getting to the inside ice. And then, but in, in that process, I, I enjoyed him. And he's, he's a coachable kid. I think he's a good teammate. Um, I'm really excited to, to seeing him again and working with him and getting his, uh, his uh, career rebooted. What's, um, well, what are your expectations? Again, we, we still have, you know, draft and free agency to go, and I understand that. But as you look at this Anaheim team right now, we focus a lot on, youth obviously and you know you mentioned a couple of names you mentioned you know mason mctavish um trevor zegras i think we throw troy terry into that conversation you mentioned jamie drysdale uh lucas dostal the the net minder of the future there who might be the net minder of the present we'll we'll see what happens uh, by the time the summer is over but based on the personnel and the key pieces that you see with anaheim right now what are the expectations for this anaheim ducks team well, I think you answered the question when you said there's a lot of movement that's going to take place in the next month with the draft and the free agency. And, you know, I don't go down that rabbit hole with Pat and his scouts, his staff's meticulous in scouting and evaluating, and they're going to put together a – I think they get six, first, uh, six picks in the first three rounds. So I'm sure they're plotting that out, who's capable of playing, you know, in training camp mm-hmm. in 2023 and what, what gets flipped at the free agent time. So – I don't know. Like that, that's gonna. I don't even want to tell you, Jeff, because that could change dramatically in the next month. For sure. My job, um, though, just, I, I just understand to, that. Yeah, my job, though, just to, is to try and create some transparency in what we're doing and, and build a culture that I think can give those guys measurables. Mm-hmm. Um, you've been at this a long time, um, and I'm, I'm always curious. I mean, you've seen a lot of players, you know, uh, come in and out of the league. Uh, you've seen, I think, of one future Hall of Famer that you saw really early in his career when he was very raw, and that's Sedano Chara. And you watched him grow into a leader and a captain and a ch- cup champion and a future Hall of Famer. Um, how have players changed 
since you started behind the bench? Uh, is, is there a profound difference or are they like, are they more similar or more different to young players when you first started? There's a profound difference. And I, I talked to, I've talked to Pat about this because he played in that generation. And you remember that Jeff, when there was fighting and the fighters were, you know, 230 pounds and there was intimidation and fear was constantly a part of your yeah. development as a player the honesty and the messaging from the coaches was direct. It was right between the eyes. And if you didn't like it too bad, there was no emotional band-aids in locker rooms back then. There was a threat of being sent down if you were a tweener and the threat of being benched if yeah. you, if you're an NHL player. So those tools that coaches use to motivate are kind of primitive now. I mean, you can still use them, but you got to balance them out. I find particularly it was a blessing to go from the Islanders to the American league, which I was at, tw- you know, whatever, 15 years before, to go into Colorado and deal with kids that are really young and then trying to, and I, 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 my thing just to summarize this is as a head coach. Now you have to listen more. You have to listen intently to what the player's mm-hmm. value system is, what their goals are, and then construct a plan. That's a, a collaborative plan. You're going to work together for these things. And then I, I, I always, like I said earlier, like it starts with honesty. And I find that kids sometimes aren't honest with themselves. They don't know because social media they're living up to an image that they might read about where may not be consistent with what the organization sees. So it's different. It's a, it's a longer process. It's not as direct. Do, do you still see, and, and you're right, like that, that, that era where everybody, every team has, you know, three or four sluggers on the bench, like that, that era is gone. Um, but what do you see? And, and maybe the answer is none. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious what you think. What do you see the role of, of toughness in the NHL? And I am talking about physical toughness. There's mental toughness and then there's physical toughness because as you well know, this Anaheim team has like, I'll just be blunt. They've had some, they've had some rough games against the Arizona Coyotes. Like that, that's like, mm-hmm. I circle those as a viewer. I circle those games. Uh, Cause I know mm-hmm. something's going to happen and there's no love lost between these, these two teams and, and these players. W- what's the role here for toughness? Because it seemed as if, you know, I'll, I'll be blunt. The moment that, you know, uh, Nick Delorier got traded, we saw a lot of teams, you know, take physical advantage of the Anaheim ducks. What's the role of toughness now for you? I, I personally still think it plays a role in the game. Um, I don't think it's as, as random and as, as um, calculated as it has, in the, has been used in the past. I think the, the, the tough guy has to be able to play. He can't play two or three minutes and then sit in the bench. I think there's yeah. got to be a role that he plays. My ideal tough guy is Matty Martin, who I had in New York. And I, I actually like mm. Colt Moore quite a bit, too, when he was in Toronto. Colt Moore was a big part of that team that made the playoffs in 2013, when a painful ending there in Boston. But because Colton had a – there's an art work to hitting – like, there is an artwork to hitting people. Some people will try to hit people and bounce off the glass and miss them and spin off checks. Colton could hit people and stick them to the wall. Matty Martin does it well. Then the next evolution of that is what are they doing after they hit the person? Are they getting the puck and valuing possession time and making plays? Because today's fourth line has to be able to sustain yeah. momentum that the other three lines build. So that's my, my that thought is... about that. And Yeah. That... Um, we're, we're heavy on time here. I, I, I wish I had more and I'd love to have you back sooner than later. Um, yeah. listen, Greg, congratulations uh, on getting the gig. Uh, a delight to have you on. Uh, you'll do great things with, with Anaheim. No doubt at all. Thanks so much for stopping by today and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest, enjoy the, uh, the draft, the rest of the Stanley cup playoffs and, and the off season. We'll, we'll, we'll check back soon. I really appreciate this, Greg. Okay. Okay, Jeff. My pleasure. See ya.